You know, tonight it's my great honor to introduce a fellow veteran who embodies the ideals of servant leadership. Whether he's in or out of public office, Governor Mike Parson lives Missouri's values. He's worn many hats. He's a farmer, a veteran, a businessman, a law enforcement officer, and most importantly, a family man. He and his wife, First Lady Teresa Parson, who we are very honored to have here in attendance. Teresa, would you stand up and let us give you a round of applause. Thank you so much for being here tonight. The First Lady of this great state, ladies and gentlemen. You know, together they have raised two children and five grandchildren. And believe me, that most of our conversation at the table tonight was about kids and grandkids and family. So as parents and grandparents, farmers and leaders, the Parsons are working together to build a better future for all our Missourians through their personal involvements, for instance, as co-chairs and the board of the board of directors for Missouri's Jobs for America's Graduates program. That's a program of special interest to the Guard since it's a program that mirrors so closely our own National Guard Youth Challenge program and we certainly appreciate what they do. Over the years, I've been blessed to get to know our Commander-in-Chief through his roles as a legislator, Lieutenant Governor, and now Governor. As a veteran, Governor Parson understands the awesome responsibilities we have in protecting our state and nation. As Commander-in-Chief, he has assured me that we will have the organizational structure and authority that the Missouri Guard needs to be an agile, able, and independent force that is always ready to serve the state of Missouri and our nation. Governor Parson is one of us. He began his journey to our state's highest office when he served in the U.S. Army as a military policeman. Like many of us, the skills he learned in the military gave him a solid foundation for future success. Governor Parson served two tours, which included a deployment to Europe. After leaving the Army, he began a career in law enforcement, culminating in his service as Polk County Sheriff from 1993 to 2005. Governor Parson next served the people of Missouri in the state legislature. He served in the Missouri House from 2005 to 2011, and then in the state Senate from 2011 to 2017. In 2016, Governor Parson won a landslide historic election to serve as Missouri's Lieutenant Governor. Throughout his career, Governor Parson has been one of the Guard's most fierce advocates and most loyal friends. And he's always gone to bat, not only for the Guard, but for the reserves and the active component as well. Everyone in this room tonight has benefited from his service. And he and his fellow Missouri legislators have made retired and active duty pay, including annual training, tax-free in Missouri. Hua, yeah, in our pockets. And this year, with his leadership for the first time, drill pay will become state tax-free. For all our M-Day folks. These are most important achievements to see that Missouri becomes the nation's most veteran-friendly state. Governor Parson is highly respected by legislators on both sides of the aisle and truly serves as the governor of all Missourians. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Governor Mike Parson, the 57th governor of the state of Missouri. Hua. Thank you very much. Please be seated. Please be seated. Man, uh, what an honor it is to be here tonight as your governor, uh, representing the men and women that serve our country, and the family members that are here tonight. I just want to say thank you for what you do. And I tell you one thing, we, uh, General Danner, 
uh, didn't say near enough about starting this organization and how large it's became and an example for the United States of America, this banquet that we're here tonight with and what it represents. But I do think we owe him and Katie and General Danner, if you and Katie would stand up, that started just 10 years ago and look where it is today. Please stand up. You know, I, I'll share just a couple of stories with you. So, you know, when I become governor, uh, you know, I become the title of commander in chief. And I've seen a lot of you enlisted guys out here tonight and some of you guys NCOs. Uh, and you know what? I, I, I have to tell you, getting promoted from sergeant to commander in chief is a pretty cool deal. I'm just telling you, it is, it's not bad. It's not bad. Matter of fact, when General Danner first introduced me as commander in chief, I started clapping. You know, I, I was wondering who he was, you know on that so no it's it's been fun uh to be able to do that uh you know you, you I, seeing all you guys and ladies here tonight in the military you know you're just gonna have to forgive me but i just got to tell you an old story uh about the army and uh, i was in the military police corps by the way you guys were the loudest tonight too you did a great job on that i just want you to know that on that but well, i went to military police and uh I got sent over to Europe, and uh, one of the things I thought I was going to wear the white gloves and the white hat and patent leather, and I was going to just really just go out there at 19 years old and make stops and just push that chest out as far as I could get it out. <laughs> Hopefully the ladies really liked me all dressed up and everything like that. And my orders were to the 25th Replacement Division, Frankfurt, Germany, and I got sent to Misau Army Depot. So a top secret installation, I might add. Also, it was an underground nuclear site where nuclear warheads were stored. And I become what is known as a tower rat, which means no white hats, no white gloves, full military infantry gear, flat vest, green, fatigues, the whole nine yards. So I'm 19 years old, and I'm in the perimeter towers on the outside and it takes you about 15 to 20 minutes for the sergeant to post you you know and they, they'll walk you out there and they'll walk you around this whole perimeter fence and you sit up there in the towers and it's probably just one of those duties that just bores you to death at first you get up there and the old country boy i'm thinking i'm looking for rabbits i'm looking for squirrels i'm looking for anything that comes in that kill zone that i got a shot at at 19 years old you know and my job was have deadly orders if something got in there you know i had to do whatever action it took to make sure they didn't get in the insulation so finally I get bored and I start reading the SOP, you know, and they say, hey, make sure you understand the SOP when you're out here, exactly what you're supposed to do. So I'm flipping through this at three o'clock in the morning and, you know, Sergeant, like I said, takes me out there, posts me, it takes me about 15 minutes for me to get out there and he posts me and says, Private Parson, Tower 6, I got it. So I go up there, I'm reading the SOP and it says, if this facility should ever be overtaken Here's the procedure. And it would said, Ramstein Air Force Base could get their pilots up, could scramble, get them up in them jets, and if they looked like it was going to come, they'd destroy the, the, destroy the facility, and it would take just a little over four minutes to get all that done. And I'm saying, you know, that's pretty impressive. They can get dressed, get in them planes, fire them up, come over here, destroy this place. And then it kind of dawns on you. I said, I, I, I wonder what's in here about how we get out of here, how they get me out of here. <laughs> That was pretty well the last paragraph, and it didn't have anything to do with me on that. So that was my first reality that I was a serviceman on that. But, uh, you know, General Danner, uh, what a fine job you've done. What, what, what a great plus you've been to my administration, along with you going through three other administrations, that you've led Missouri's National Guard through a period of unparalleled growth and success. On your watch, the Missouri National Guard is the strongest it has ever been. Of course, you always, and I want you to understand this, men and women that are here tonight, of course, you will always credit the organization's success to the thousands of soldiers, airmen, civilians, and family members who've sacrificed so much for our state and our nation. But I thank you for your service to this nation and our state. As a veteran and a former NCO, I'd especially like to 
that recognize our enlisted soldiers and airmen for their service, from the newest privates and airmen to the most seasoned sergeant majors and chiefs. Thank you for what you do every day. One of the highest honors I have as governor is serving as the commander in chief of our National Guard. Through my time in civilian law enforcement and in state government, I've had the opportunity to see the Guard in action countless times. I know the value you bring to our state and the incredible sacrifices you make at home and abroad. In that spirit, let us take time to remember the hundreds of Missouri soldiers and airmen currently serving overseas. They are, they are among the thousands of brave men and women serving around the world who make it possible for us to celebrate the blessing of our great state and our great nation. Being separated during the holidays is tough. The First Lady and I know each of you are supporting your deployed comrades and their families. That's because so many of you know what it means to spend the holidays away from home. Since September the 11th, 2001, you have supported more than 20,000 individual deployments. You have served in places like Iraq, Afghanistan, Kosovo, Kuwait, and many other locations. In that same time period, you've mobilized to protect the good people of Missouri from all crises occurring at home. Since 9-11, more than 14,000 guardsmen have mobilized for more than 30 state emergencies. Your selfishness service during the past two decades has led Missouri reputation as the nation's best National Guard. You can measure your success in how many first Missouri's have had in the past 10 years. You are first or near first in every important training and readiness metric. You were one of the first states the Army allowed to deploy from home station. You were the first state on mission on the southwest border this year. You were the first state to deploy to Texas during the terrible 2017 hurricane season. You were the first guard to host an Open Skies Treaty event. And for those of you who don't know, the Open Skies Treaty is a critical international instrument for peace that allows US, Russian, and allied nations to conduct overflights to ensure everyone is meeting their treaty obligations. Your marksmanship team absolutely dominated this year's National Guard and all Army marksmanship competition. How about that? Now in my younger day, I might have been on that team. I want you to know this. Oh, another one of these things I remember about the Army. I fired expert in the M16 rifle, the 45, the M60 machine gun, and the one I really admired the most was expert in hand grenades. For me, hand grenades is a lot like horseshoes. Just get it close, and you'll be good on that. The, your Homeland Response Force was rated the best this year, and to be the best this year and the years to come, I hope. Your 131st Bomb Wing partnership with the 509th Bomb Wing is the gold standard and has resulted in repeated recognition as the nation's best bomb wing. Your soldiers and airmen, drawing on their vast civilian agriculture experience, spearheaded the Agribusiness Development Team Initiative in Afghanistan. You stood up one of the nation's first and by far the best cyber teams. Now Missouri Cyber is routinely called to train not only the Guard and active duty troops, but other government agencies as well. Your Show Me Gold initiative is the nation's most successful guard officer deployment program. Your Advanced Airlift Tactics Training Center is recognized as one of the world's premier airlift training centers and draws airmen from more than 18 nations.
These first, these achievements create more opportunities. The Defense Department knows you can handle any mission. That's why Missouri Guardsmen continue to be tapped for missions and exercises like Patriot, Bondelore, Vigilant Guard, and Sabre Junction. That's why Missouri was chosen to participate in the Chief of the National Guard Bureau's bilateral initiative with the Israel Homeland Command. That's why you're among the first and the heaviest task units when the Army unveils its focused readiness objective. And that's why Missouri continues to receive high levels, no-fail missions like those recently carried out by the 35th Infantry Division, the 35th Engineer Brigade, and the currently deployed 35th Combat Aviation Brigade. And that is why Missouri continues to gain new units as other states struggle to meet their recruiting goals. As an MP, I am especially proud to have been your commander in chief when the 35th Military Police Brigade was stood up earlier this month. A lot of departments tell me that they do more with less. The National Guard, in true Missouri fashion, has shown me that. You prioritize resource management and mission accomplishments. In the past 10 years, you've had 11% drop in expenditures, 11%. In the same time period, the Guard's economic impact has more than doubled. In 2008, the Guard's impact to the state of Missouri was $800 million. And that's a big number for most of us here tonight. But in 2018, 10 years later, your economic impact was around $1.7 billion to the state of Missouri. And I thank each and every one of you for that. And that economy impact just isn't felt in the 47 counties where we have armories, but in all 114 counties where our soldiers and airmen and their families call home. In the past 10 years, you've added more than 100 acres to Missouri's training sites and armories, often donated at no cost to the government through construction. You've added more than 400,000 square feet to the National Guard's footprint. You are responsible stewards of how our taxpayer dollars. Down in Southwest Missouri, we're very proud of the Aviation Classification and Repair Activity Depot in Springfield. The soldiers and civilians who work there have saved taxpayers over $100 million each year through innovations like the fiber optic gyro validator, which has invented and fabricated at that facility, and no wonder they're considered the nation's best. And thank you for that. Your innovations bring more missions, more money, and more jobs to Missouri. And you're still going strong. You're in a period of unprecedented growth. Both Army and Air finished this 2018 physical year at over 100% manning. At the same time, we are focused on retaining quality service members by taking care of soldiers and airmen. General Danner is committed to maintaining the social contract. When you sign up, you volunteered to serve one weekend a month and two, two, two weeks a year so you could be ready to serve when your state and nation needed you. Each of you has always answered that call. Your leadership is firm in ensuring the organization is held to the 29 to the 39 training days you committed to. There will always be opportunities for those who want to volunteer to do more. But the Missouri National Guard recognizes the price you and your families have paid in blood, sweat over the past decades. We also recognize the sacrifice of, you, of our own civilian employers who make guard and reserve services possible. By emphasizing the social contract, we are recognized and honoring those sacrifices. This is made possible by operating more efficiency over the past decade 
and the Guard has taken innovative steps to ensure maximum efficiency. Recently, recently, and I envy you guys for this one. I wish I could get there. But recently, much of the Guard moved to a 40-hour week, four days a week. General Danner tells me the Guard has already identified major cost savings and efficiency as a result. Morale, which is so important to our military, has improved as a result. And General Danner, I thank you for doing that, making your employees to have that opportunity. <laughs> Matter of fact, I envy you on that one, for sure. And as the state government implements its engaged program, there are a lot of lessons we can learn from the Guard. You've taken the best practice of the military and civilian sectors to craft a world-class organization. As a young MP, I took the leadership lessons I learned from the military and applied them throughout my life. And I wanted all of state government to reflect the professionalism, the mentorship, and the continuous improvement of our military values. When I tell you that paragraph, that paragraph probably means as much as me as anything. Because I literally do not believe I would be here in front of you tonight if it hadn't been for my service for my country. I do not. I do not leave. I'd be the governor of the state of Missouri. I often tell people, and one of the things I learned in the military that I try to still practice to this day, I always tell everybody, leadership is never about being the best. It is not. Leadership is not about being the best. Leadership is about making others better. That's what true leadership is. And I believe that from the bottom of my heart. Professional development is a top priority. Leadership at all levels are working to ensure soldiers and airmen are on track with the military training and education courses throughout their careers. All are encouraged to use their state and federal tuition assistance to pursue college and technical training. As an organization, the Missouri Guard has adopted civilian concepts like Lean Six Sigma and military concepts like the Army Communities of Excellence. Through it all, soldiers, airmen, and civilian employees have always been able to count on constant mentorship in the form of performance reviews, counseling, and after action reviews. This time of year, this time of year, Communications is especially important. The holidays are tough for some folks. And as a veteran, it pains me to see the epidemic of suicides facing our military communities across this nation. I ask each of you, take some time. Take some time during this time. Take some time to reach out to some of your friends. Check out them, let them know you care. And if you are having a tough time, please reach out. Please reach out. Less than 1% of Americans are serving in uniform. Today, according to the VA, less than 8% of our population are veterans. In other words, there aren't that many of us ladies and gentlemen, so we have to take care of one another. I know that you will because that's what Americans' service members have always done. As your Commander-in-Chief, I am honored to lead you. As a fellow veteran, I'm proud to stand in your company. I want to finish tonight by not using a script by talking about how important my service was to my country. When I was in the Army, 19 years old, I come from a little town of 356 people in this state. My folks were humble farmers. That's how I grew up, me and my four brothers. Didn't have a lot of material things, but we had everything. My mom and dad were married 63 years, good Christian family, and they loved doing what they did. They really did. And as I grew up in that little town, there was two flags that flew over that town. There's one over the post office, and there's one over the schoolhouse. And every day, we said the Pledge of Allegiance to the United States of America. 
I did not really know the importance of the flag of the United States of America and the Pledge of Allegiance till I donned the uniform of the United States Army. I did not. I've learned my history. I knew what the lessons were. But when I wore that uniform that you all have that honor and privilege to wear, I realized it was not about me. It wasn't. It was really about all the men and women that wore that uniform before I did that had based our country on our rights, on our freedoms, and a love that's undescribable for what they believe in this country. Much the same reason you have them uniforms on today when I wore that one, that's what I thought of about it. And I thought about all the sacrifices they made, all of our conflicts in our country, and what people had done for us, for me and you to be here tonight to enjoy this evening, but more importantly, what they done has been passed down from generation to generation, from our parents, from our grandparents, and I'll even go all the way back to our forefathers, when it was things called the Declaration of Independence, the Constitution, the Bill of Rights, and all of that has been passed down to me and you. Here we sit tonight, to me and you. And I tell you this, and what drives me every day to go to work, to be the governor of this great state. All of us have lived the American dream and are living the American dream. We truly are. And if I had a chance to talk to every one of you tonight, and I ask you if you're living it, you would tell me you are. You might tell me there's ups and downs in the American dream. I get that. I've sure went through my share. But I would also tell you, the only reason you've lived that American dream is because what people done before you. And I tell you, it is our time, mine and your time together, to make sure that we keep the American dream alive for the next generations and we stick up for the United States of America. It is a honor and privilege to be the 57th governor of the state of Missouri. God bless you. God bless the great state of Missouri. And God bless the United States of America. Thank you very much for having me here tonight. Thank you.